Hello, welcome to Ops and Rolls, and this week we're taking a deep dive into the crispy of crispiest history. For an open window on a crappy world, Max and Chris from Ups and Rolls. Ups and All right, so this week, if you haven't guessed it yet or haven't checked it in the actual title of the video, we'll be talking about ligers. So yes, we already did a video on ligers. It's already two years old. So of course, we'll be updating a couple of those Beer 101 videos. So before we jump into this one, please go drop down in the comment section your recommendation towards a new subject or maybe a subject that we haven't covered properly or that needs to be revamped we're 100 percent in to redo all those fantastic videos with the new knowledge that we have now ligers back in history they've been known forever like forever it's one of the most popular yeast out there and for one specific reason the taste that it gives every single time you're using it. So yes, you get a crispier, cleaner beer out of your fermentation. Why all this? Max got all the science figured out, so I won't go through a lot on this, not spending too much time, but in history, mostly lagers have been proeminent in the northern part of Europe. Mostly Germany, but obviously all the countries around were experimenting with this bottom fermented yeast. So obviously being in the northern part of Europe really benefited those farmers back in the day to brew beers that were able to age through winter time into the caves. So they weren't prone or stuck with not having the right technology for refrigeration and making those crisper, nicer, cleaner beers in the end process. Obviously, now we moved on to a newer technologies, a better refrigeration process, and also specialized tanks to brew those beers. Being bottom fermented, you need to clean them up after a couple of weeks of aging, so it needs special equipment through the process. So why is it so popular to this day? It's because big macro beers were benefiting a lot from this clean, clear yeast it provided such a nice clean and easy drinking beer back in the day that now it just grew into one of the biggest yeast used in beer but max is there any specifics when brewing with lager yeast let's say your own brewer or just basically a brewer working on it what are the specifics behind it Thanks, Chris. Now let's take a look at the mechanics behind lager yeast, why it's so important, why, how you ferment with it, and why would you ferment with it? The main three things is the cold temperatures of fermentation. The other question a lot of people ask is, why is it bottom fermentation and the cellaring of that product? Uh, cold fermentation. Lager, uh, lager yeast ferments at around 12 degrees Celsius, which is kind of phenomenal in the sense that ale yeast tends to ferment around 18 up. Uh, sometimes a little lower depending on the flavors you want to develop with that yeast. But lager is extremely low in temperature when it comes to fermentation, which is partly the reason why you would be looking at bottom fermentation for lagers and why the cellaring is a lot longer than your normal ale. So. Cold temperature means two things. The first one is longer periods of fermentation. Your yeast is not quite as fast, as vigorous in the fermentation. It's gonna take a lot longer to get to your end result, which is not necessarily bad because it does create more crispy flavors for that beer, which is why the macros tend to choose lagers over, over ales. Uh, the second thing with cold fermentation is a clearer product. Now, the way it works with, with cloudiness in any IPAs is you still have a lot of um, yeast and proteins that are gonna stay in suspension in the liquid. When it comes to a lager yeast, because the colder temp temperatures are there, your, your yeast is not gonna spend as much time in that liquid. It's actually gonna fall out quite fast. Same thing with the proteins. Higher temperature of a liquid means that you're gonna have an easier uh, mending of those proteins and that yeast. Uh, I guess the best example is when you're mixing salt in water, uh, 
uh, you're gonna see that if the water is extremely cold, the salt is gonna have a harder time getting into solution as if your water is a little higher in temperature, maybe not quite boiling, but a little higher, you're gonna have an easier time mixing those two together, having the, uh, the molecules kind of mold, fold together and connect in a efficient way. Which is the same concept here. Colder temperature means that that's not happening as much. So your end result is gonna be a lot clearer. Now cellaring, because it takes a lot longer, you're giving it a lot more time to fall out of solution. Uh, naturally, yeast not performing as well, it's falling out of solution. You get a clearer product in the end which is kind of phenomenal. Uh, cellaring, or let's talk about the, the actual vessel right now. Most of the equipment that brewers are using these days uh, are actually lager fermentation tanks. So do you know the fermentation tanks with a cone at the bottom? Uh, that is designed for lagers because lagers are bottom fermentation. As you're crashing the tank, the yeast is, is crashing to the bottom of that tank and you can reuse that yeast a few times before you have to get rid of it. And because lagers are bottom fermentation, your good yeast is actually in that bottom part of the tank, which makes it a lot more efficient. With ales, it's a little different. Now that's fermentation with lagers. There's not just fermentation you gotta think of when it comes to brewing a lager. There's also your boil time and your mash regimen. Now, uh, boil time is especially important because you don't have those complex flavors or as much complex flavor as you have in ales. You have a lot less to hide off flavors behind. Uh, a longer boil means that you're flashing off a lot of those uh, bad molecules that are gonna affect the flavor of the beer later, uh, the big one being DMS, so that corn, uh, vegetal kind of aspect of grain, which is in, in most beers, uh, but with lagers, you, you feel a lot more. So the more you boil, the more you evaporate those flavors, faster you cool, faster you send fermentation, the least amount you're gonna have. The next time you have a, a, a Pilsner or a lager or uh, one of those macro beers, have a taste, see if you get those off flavors. Sometimes they stick around. But that's, that's the thing, is it's not just about fermentation in the case of lager, it's your whole process around that kind of changes. Another aspect that changes is post fermentation. Uh, you want to age that beer out a little longer. Uh, I talked about cellaring. Cellaring is not just the fermentation process, but it's also going to be once it's in the bright tank or once it's off the yeast, you want to leave it there for a little longer, for a few weeks, just to, again, have a bit of those proteins and, and the rest of that uh, yeast fall out of solution, but also it's going to mature as a beer. With lagers, it's a little different. It's kind of, as soon as it's unfermenting, you take it off, and then within a couple days, you kind of want it in the product. You want it as fast as possible in there. Well, that's kind of the process of, of lagers. Now, uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the yeast a little more. Again, lager is mostly yeast. And there's a few cool things the industry kind of discovered about this yeast that I'll get into a little later. Chris, back to you. So as usual, sometimes when I redo those videos, I like to sit down, go on Instagram and ask questions away to our viewers to maybe just update with their own questions on the subject. So let's dive into those questions. So how detrimental to not ferment lager at a low temp? Is 70 degrees Fahrenheit okay? The answer to that is by hot fermenting this lager yeast, you use you lose most of what a lager yeast is made of. You'll just be prone to more off flavors in your beer, which is not really what you want in this process. Second question, is it really a lager if you cold condition a beer made with another kind of yeast? In that optic, if you look at Kolsch's, it's a nail that's been lagered. So it's kind of like a hybrid between both of them. I think you still steer out of uh, lager if you're not using the lager yeast. Let's say you cold ferment a kvike yeast, then it's still a kvike. It doesn't become a lager uh, during nighttime, right? So I think that evolving through it or having hybrids around this specific yeast is what you're gonna end up with. All right, to add some spice to this beer 101, we decided to bring in one theory that not a lot of videos out there or article out there are covering and it's the actual origin of lager yeast. Recent studies, like re recent, recent, 2012, 14, in those areas, it's not that recent, oh, god damn. 
still uh, shown that they've seen in Tibet and Patagonia little or not little but the actual ancestor of the Liger yeast. It, that's where it originated naturally in, in its natural state. So how did it come to Europe at this point? And some researchers came through barrels that have been used to move some ingredients from Patagonia to Europe or actual yeast going through the Silk Roads back from Tibet to Europe. And it's a very fantastic theory and we've discussed quite a lot around it, me and Max, since those are both regions of the world where it's actually cold enough to have the proper environment, the proper flora for this yeast to grow out and naturally. Obviously, maybe we could have this in Canada, I guess, since we have the same sort of temperatures up north, but I'm still not sure if the researchers are at this point right now. But Max, uh, you've done the research, you read a bit more about this theory, and uh, obviously I want your opinion on it. It's still kind of like, not controversial, but people like to just refer to Liger as being the main yeast used in Northern Europe and Germany, and that's where it mostly grew out to be what we know as Liger yeast today. So Max, what's your take on it? So earlier, Chris mentioned the uh, Germanic influence to create lagers, pilsners, and, and those kinds of beer with the cellaring, the cold, all that, which is great. The only issue is that ale yeast doesn't necessarily or doesn't like fermenting cold. There are a lot of strains that just can't handle it or not going to ferment efficiently. Uh, now, when we're talking to ale yeast, we're talking to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the yeast strain that kind of controls most of the beer brewing in this industry. Uh, lager yeast is a little different because it's actually a, a hybrid, a blend between two major yeast families, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharo Saccharomyces urbianus. It's all Latin words, very hard to pronounce. I'm sure they're going to be written down somewhere. If you want to learn more, just Google it. You'll see how it's pretty, how it's spelt out and you'll see why I always struggle with pronouncing these. Anyways, the importance of that is that, or be honest, ferments a little colder, helping the fermentation along. So when you have Saccharomyces cerevisiae mixing with this one, you create a hybrid that can handle those colder temperatures and longer fermentation periods. Now, ale yeast is found all around. It's on fruit skins, it's on, it's airborne, it's on your clothes, it's everywhere. Ale yeast is, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is everywhere. It's all around us. Um, the rest of the hybrid, hybrid, is any, hybrid, hybridization of those two yeast strains happened with human influence. Uh, the German monks were fermenting in caves, so they were putting the wort in those caves at colder temperatures and, and letting it ferment naturally. They didn't necessarily know about, about yeast, so it was kind of a happy accident, but by doing that over and over again, they help with that, that hybridization. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Anyways, they help with that in those barrels, but to get Saccharomyces urbianus, or to get all those yeast strains together, and to get a yeast strain that was cold resistant, is kind of unheard of. You would think that it would have happened beforehand. Now, one of the reasons why it didn't happen beforehand is no one really knew about it. It kind of just appeared out of nowhere. Now, there's two main theories. Uh, the first theory is that that yeast strain uh, that helped with that hybridization uh, was found in uh, South America. So as the Europeans were uh, colonizing or invading, depending on how you want to see it, uh, South America uh, and America in general, they, they took back some of that bacteria in the ships and the wood and the barrels they were using. And then from there, those barrels, that wood might have influenced the uh, the process to be able to create lager yeast. The other theory is that, well, not theory, I mean, those strains have been found there and also in the mountains of Tibet, which to me makes a lot more sense considering that it's a lot colder temperatures, so that yeast might have had to be a little, uh, a little, more used to uh, colder temperatures in fermentation to be able to survive. But those are the two main theories uh, as to where those yeast strains came from and were able to mold and create lager yeast, which is unprecedented. It hadn't happened before and it hasn't happened since. Yeah, that's 
pretty much what I got on the lager yeast. I think it's a great yeast to work with. As I've mentioned before, Pilsner's is, is one of my favorite styles, if not my favorite style of beer. I like the balance of the beer. That's Beer should be balanced. I, I enjoy the extremes, like uh, extreme sours or IPAs that are more on the bitter side or pushing more the fruity flavor of the hop, uh, or even stouts that are more on the grain aspect of it, the roast, the coffee, the chocolate character of it. But nothing really beats a good balanced uh, lager in the summer when it's warm outside and you just want to pound a few back, you know, a couple crispy boys. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please let us know in the comments below. And we've done a video on Kvike in the past. Uh, there's a lot of parallels, 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 parallels that can be made between lagers and Kvike. And if you guys want to know more, let us know in the comments below. Uh, and we'll do another video on Kvike. It's a very important yeast when it comes to just the modern day, uh, as well as back in the past. So uh, let us know. If you like the video again, leave a like, subscribe, share, and we'll see you guys in the next one.